if you're going to have choice, the ability to have free will, I'm going to do something or not do something, whatever I damn please, the free will. Uh, you've got to have the ability to actually initiate movement, uh, where area four goes to the head of the caudate, another C term, caudate, to the putamen, the globus, thalamus, thalamus, and then up to the motor strip. This net loop is in inhibitory. One excess of GABA, and it's an inhibitory loop. But another C word, the cingulate. If the cingulate becomes involved with the basal ganglia, it changes the circuit. It adds one more loop. And it goes from the caudate to the putamen globus pallidus subthalamus thalamus, adding one more GABA into this, making it a double negative. And that is obviously a double negative. There's a perseveration. So instead of being an inhibitory circuit, if the cingulate becomes involved in the circuit, it becomes a perseverative circuit. The frontal lobe's command stop becomes the command stop stopping. All the, the single it flips that one little tiny cross, you know, cross pathway in there, and it changes the inhibition uh, to perseveration. And that's part of the reason that the single is involved in in uh, uh, obsessive compulsive and oppositional defiant, and also lack of initiation, lack of motivation gives you your normal cognitive and emotional flexibility when it's working. Welcome to NeuroNoodle's Neurofeedback and Neuropsychology Podcast featuring tech legend Jay Gunkelman. He is the man who has read over a half a million brain scans. Our goal is to provide information and promote options for better mental health. The NeuroNoodle Podcast is supported by listeners and viewers just like you. A special thanks to our gold and silver supporters. Earn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neurosciences NeuroGuide Workshop December 10th and 11th in Madeira Beach, Florida. It's led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend online or in person with the link appliedneuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. And if you sign up now, you can join Dr. Robert Thatcher at his house for a pre-course get together December 9th. It's going to be a blast. What a better way to enjoy winter by being in Madeira Beach, Florida and earning up to 16 CEU hours. Sign up now at AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. MindMedia.com. Get the latest EEG and neurofeedback technology from MindMedia.com. Their semi-dry sensor cap is a wonder to see and their EEG amplifiers have been trusted in the field for decades. Their neurofeedback and QEEG courses will get you up to speed in no time. Visit mindmedia.com now. So Jay Gunkelman, here we are going through the alphabet of neurofeedback. We're on the letter C. What do you have for us today? Yeah, we're going to start out with something simple, cortex. Um, okay. You know, the old 1020 system was established a long time ago, Rasmussen and Penfield. Um, it, it, this was uh, 1948, 49, when they came up with the system. And it's not the only system. The Mayo Clinic has its own system. It's a little bit more linear than curvilinear. But, you know, you've got to end up having a reliable, repeatable spot to get the electrodes if you're going to transfer data from one lab to the next. So they came up with the 1020 system as the standard electrode placements. The letters re re uh, were supposed to reflect the lobe or the location on the cortex and the number, uh, odd numbers left, even numbers right. And you can see three, three, three kind of line up. Now, the modified nomenclature uh, came out over a decade ago uh, for 1010. When you have twice as many electrodes, uh, sometimes the numbers that we see here don't really quite line up as well as they could. So it's now F7, T7, P7, 
seven. And you think, well, P, they've changed the lobe. Yeah, well, they're honest about it. This isn't actually in the temporal lobe. It's on the parietal side of the temporal parietal junction. So they corrected the misstatement in the letter indicating that this was temporal. Now, it doesn't change what it reflects. There's still, there's still you know, hippocampal function, and the parahippocampal cortex is reflected in this general area. Um, you know, the, you still have the same generators. It's just that they've straightened out the name, 777, like 333, ZZZ, 444. And now it's 888, so F-A-T-A-P-8. And uh, the, the improved uh, uh, system is what you should be using uh, because if you're going to publish in anything that's a real respectable journal, they expect you to use the uh, modified nomenclature. Kind of like if there was a new, you know, Wexler 12, you know. <laughs> so uh, it, it, they replaced all the prior versions of the Wexler, whatever. Uh, they're, and they're not up at 12, obviously. So it's just an exaggeration. But uh, uh, the, the, the cortex is essentially the, the primary generator of all of the voltages that we see as far as the voltage is concerned, not necessarily the rhythmicity. The cortex makes beta rhythm, um, that that's a small cortical loop. But other than that, everything else requires other turf in order to make their rhythmicity. So when we look at the uh, uh, surface, you have to imagine uh, deeper sources, basically. Now, the... When we started to learn EEG, they told us that we had to put the electrodes on exactly the right spot so that it would be exactly on the right spot. But later, they actually did a study. You know, when ElectroCap International came out with the ElectroCap, uh, which was made for NASA, it was a spandex cap that would size appropriately to the person stick the electrodes in the proper location without having to have the uh, time and energy of a, of a registered tech measuring, marking, prepping, and placing electrodes. And the electro cap was much faster. Um, and the, the techs basically were a little upset. They thought that, you know, it was inaccurate. You know, how could this pulling some spandex cap on somebody's head give you the precision of the measurements and marking and and uh, scrubbing out the mark and then placing electrode at each of these spots. So they basically put the electro cap on and they used a little magnetic die tag where each of the electrodes would have gone. And then they put that person in an MRI and they showed basically where on the brain that electrode would have ended up. And they did the same thing with people measuring and marking where they would have placed an electrode. And what they found is that, in fact, there's a lot of slop. Not with where people put the marks on the surface, but we don't have standardized brains stuck inside of a standardized skull in a standardized way. Uh, every brain has got its own unique little shape. Uh, we looked at, at uh, Einstein's brain and found it to be really quite, you know, non-neurotypical. Um, you know, it had its own little oddities. Um, and every brain does. So uh, we don't have a standardized brain inside of, a, inside of a standardized skull. We still want to put all the spots on the right spots on the outside and we just know now that it's a little more sloppy as to exactly where you get inside. Um, as, as an example, C4 had, had a wide variety of little spots somewhere near C4 that um, it was actually located on, on a brain. You know, uh, and uh, we don't have standardized Montreal Neurological Certified Brains, you know, so... Um, uh, we, we do have a little uh, variability. 
Uh, we still want to be as accurate as we can from the outside so we don't end up with gross asymmetries that are due to the electric placements. But the cortex is an important source for us because that's where most of the voltage in the EEG is generated. So your neurosurgeon hopes you have these beautiful colored brains that are, you know, they can look inside and say, oh, the motor strip, oh, the sensory strip. Um, the, the, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, the cerebellum, the frontal uh, lobe, and, you know, um, the, 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 the cingulate. So uh, they, they hope you've got this kind of a brain because once they're in there, it's a little hard to know when you just pull away the, 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 the skin and skull and the meninges exactly what they're pointing at. And if they're going to cut out a piece or uh, do something to a piece of your brain, uh, they're going to have to have the right spot because everybody's spots are slightly different, as we just saw. So uh, they actually uh, remove a piece of the surface and they'll start to stimulate or test what function is present at what location. Quite often, surgeries of the brain are done when people are still awake. Um, or at least started while they're still awake so they can identify where the speech motor areas are. They don't want to go in to take out a tumor, a little meningioma that's usually fairly benign as an extraction, if it's going to end up damaging the spot that allows the person to speak. Now, there's other functions in other spots that are just as important as speech. You know, um, you know the ability to actually move um it you don't want to end up messing something up without it being your actual intention so the exact location here is important as you can see here this is the temporal lobe and it's been separated down from where it should be so this is pulled down to open up to open up and, and show the insular cortex and the auditory cortex. The auditory cortex is actually enfolded into the temporal parietal junction. It doesn't point out, it points up. And uh, as such, from the low frequencies to the high frequencies, you basically end up having a tonotopic specific relay of your cochlea, another C, your cochlea. So um, the cortex has specific functions in specific areas. This is primary auditory. This is Wernicke's area. Wernicke studied language comprehension and both auditory and visual language comprehension. Um, this is somatosensory, somatomotor. They're actually so tightly intertwined that they're referred to as, as the somatosensory strip. And, um, and somatomotor strip, but they're the sensory motor strip because if you stimulate one, you get reactions out of the other. They're very, very tightly intertwined. The pink area just in front of the motor strip is the supplementary or supramotor area. And that's actually where the pianist sits. Everyone thinks that the, the, the motor strip is where the, the action is. But, you know, it's like a that's the keyboard on a piano. If you hit the note, you're going to get a movement. But who's there playing that damn piano? Well, the frontal lobe has the premotor, supplementary, supramotor area. And that's where fixed action patterns. Um, you've learned your signature. You know, you can, you can do your signature without looking. If you signed your signature a thousand times in a row, because of a gigantic meeting or an event or uh, memorabilia. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to end up signing a whole stack, <clears throat> pardon me, a whole stack of things. And when you have to, you have to. So a, a fixed action patterns are already built in. How you walk, uh, your swim, your swimming stroke, your running stride, um, your passing uh, motion if you're a, a quarterback, all those things are learned. In fact, uh, golf or your golf swing, it's, it's overlearned to the point where if you're really good at it, 
you shouldn't be thinking about it. If your frontal lobe gets too involved with thinking about what you're doing with your feet when you're running, you'll probably not end up upright. You'll probably end up on your ass. So uh, what we what we really need to, to know is that the brain, when it learns how to do something, it can be kind of allowed to do it without as much oversight. Now, there's a speech area here, and sometimes my speech area gets going a little more than it should, and I should have a little bit more oversight. But um, in, in general, you can see specific functions in specific locations. This is more like what the neurosurgeon would see if they popped the top. Now, where's that nice somatosensory somatomotor strip coming down? Uh, where's the color-coded temporal parietal junction? Where and, and why is there so much dark stuff in between these these lumps? Well, this brain has had some atrophy. Um, you, you can see the cortex here. Sometimes it's called ropey because it looks kind of like rope. Some people refer to it as intestinal. Yeah, it kind of looks like a lump of intestines, you know. So, uh, but it, it's it's not tightly packed, uh, densely packed. It, it's loose, and this is due to cortical atrophy, probably Alzheimer's disease. You can see some sensory areas that are still a little tighter, but the 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 uh, somatosensory, somatomotor, temporal area the lateral frontal area, all of this is pretty loose. So atrophy, the gyri are narrower, the sulci are deeper and broader. And, and this is an atrophied brain. And you don't end up wanting to have an atrophied brain. Um, how do you get one? Well, you know, poor care, um, uh, excess trauma, um, you know, poor diet, uh, you know, the, there's so many ways to end up damaging the brain. Uh, it's, it's almost a miracle uh, that we don't end up all having dramatic brain damage, even just after the birth canal trip. So we're, we're, we're lucky that we're born without a fully developed cortex and that it develops across time because it's quite a squeeze uh, getting, uh, getting born and delivered. You're born with about twice as many neurons as you have in your late teens. You prune or eliminate uh, neurons that aren't being used properly, um, and uh, the ones that are used are fostered. So you've seen the homunculus, and this is a motor homunculus and the motor homunculus basically has feet and legs little skinny back gigantic hands a gigantic face a tongue now as you go into the the sylvian fissure to the insular cortex um, you actually have the entire inside of your elementary tract so from inside of your mouth until it comes out the other end, all the smooth muscles are represented in this area. So um, it, you, you can kind of predict where along the homunculus, the motor, the somatosensory or somatomotor strip, these functions are going to locate. And if you're missing something like the hand, if you don't have an input from the hand and you can, you can get phantom pain, Stimulation in an adjacent area actually triggers sensation in the area that's been that's been lost. So you can have um, is neuroplasticity going to arrive? It's it's uh, uh, cortical plasticity uh, that that's uh, uh, phantom pain, phantom sound if you have tinnitus. Um, uh, uh, movement disorders can uh, also be a similar. Uh, a, a shift in function. Um, the, on the bottom here, in the front of the brain, you see all these little arrows. 
if you stimulate an area along this uh, strip, the, this is the frontal eye fields. If you stimulate an area there, the eye movements go in the directions of the arrows. So um, your ability to actually move your eyes functionally to, to scan across a page and read and continue to focus at various depths as you go across the page. All of that is controlled by frontal eye fields. Uh, when the frontal lobes are not working as well, in attentional and affective disorders, uh, psychiatric disorders and that sort of thing, quite often you'll end up having an excessive amount of eye movements or poorly regulated eye movements. And they're, they're all because of cortical function. Now, the eyes have been removed. Um, uh, uh, the, the optic uh, nerve to the eye is, has been truncated here and here. This is the optic chiasm goes back to the lateral geniculate of the thalamus. And these are optical radiations that are white matter tracks, high-speed white matter tracks going back to the visual cortex. There's actually an upper and a lower division. Your upper left visual quadrant goes to the lower left uh, cortical area at the back of the head. So it's, it's not just right, left, it's also up, down. So the upper left visual field goes to the lower left uh, 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 upper right, uh, lower left, uh, lower right, upper left, crisscross. At the chiasm, crisscrosses left to right, and from here back, you also get the uh, upper and lower uh, visual quadrants uh, split apart. And again, you can see the, the upper and lower segments of that. Uh, and so that's, you know, vision gets things to the cortex. But if we had, you know, uh, th there's actually more names for more places than you see here. If we had to have the entire cortex exposed, we'd have to have a lot more knowledge about locations on the cortex because the the presence of the skin and skin, the skin, the skull, the meninges all laid on top of the cortex, a, a, a single thalamocortical column might be two to four millimeters in size at the head of the thalamocortical column. But it gives us a six centimeter diameter response on the surface of the skin. So it cuts down a little bit on how much resolution we have to have spatially of knowing exactly where something came from because it is smeared all over the place by the skin and the skull and the meninges. We're trying a lot of times to get a very focal answer from neuroimaging from a very smeared surface source. The EEG has a decreased resolution unless you're doing corticogram work where you actually have the cortex exposed. And then you have very, very high resolution. Again, every thalamocortical column has every two to four millimeters. So, you know, instead of having uh, every approximately three centimeters having an electrode, you'd have to have electrode after electrode after electrode every millimeter or so. We'd have to have thousands and thousands of electrodes on our head. Now, if we had to have that, we would not be doing EEGs today because there, there was no technology that would be able to have delivered that historically. It, it, it would have been just a waste of time. Um, it, uh, it, it, at this point, uh, we've, we've got EEG. Uh, it works very nicely, uh, predicting states of consciousness, um, altered states of consciousness, uh, predicting intelligence, uh, capacity, special skill sets. Um, it, it's, you know, we've got a tremendous advancement, uh, even with the low resolution that we do see. Loretta, low resolution electromagnetic tomography, shows us cortical sources very nicely. Now, cortex is connected cortex from one side is connected to the other side through the corpus callosum uh, and through the anterior commissure and posterior commissure uh, side to side. There's also 
unsonant fasciculus that connects the lateral and orbital frontal lobes with the the uncus area on the mesial temporal uh, surface. And this, this allows, this is a bidirectional pathway. It allows the temporal lobe to communicate with the front, but also with the front to communicate with the temporal lobe. And we also have longitudinal, superior and inferior longitudinal fasciculi, and all of these little tiny arcuate fasciculi that connect one spot to the next. So we are connected. Our brain has point A gets to point B to point C to point D, and there's lots of ways to get from point A to point B. So uh, we, we've got a lot of pathways, luckily, because, you know, the longer the pathway, the more likely it is to be damaged when you bonk your brain. Brains don't stretch very well. And the longer the pathway, the more likely it is to be damaged when you damage our brain. But luckily, we got a lot of redundancy uh, because, believe me, by the time we're at the end of our line, we've done a lot of damage to the old noggin. Um, and, you know, goodness, you know, don't start to swap scar stories with me. So uh, um, this is the Fox cerebri. This is the dura matter that lines the brain, the tentorum that separates the brain from the cerebellum. And this is as tough as shoe leather when you're not really, really young. And it becomes like a cleaver set in between the hemispheres. And let's say you get to a certain age, like, oh, 30 years old. You've been playing sandlot football since you're little. And you're finally made it into the, the, the big time. You're in your 30s. You, you're you're brain is starting to get kind of tough and leathery and you're going full speed ahead and you whack somebody uh, with your helmet that you think protects your head, but your head stops suddenly. Well, your brain keeps going. It's going to bump into the Falk cerebri and it's going to have damage between the right and left frontal lobes connections. You, 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 you damage the connectivity between the hemispheres. So um, when you're young, the same kind of a bonk in the head probably wouldn't do the same kind of damage. Now, it's not to say you can't damage your head when, the, when a kid's young. I mean, concussions happen in young kids, too. Uh, but the, the, the kinds of damage that you have get more severe as, you're, as your brain ages. As your brain ages, when you get to be my age, it shrinks, too. Um, you know, I'm in my 70s, and by that time, there's been some tropic changes. Uh, a, a tropic change doesn't mean you, you've, you've got a fancy drink and you're sitting under a palm tree. Um, the, the, a tropic change here is atrophy. Uh, it's not hypertrophy. You're not developing more and more as you get older and older. You're, you're actually losing some cell uh, density. So the brain has shrunk some. And if somebody of my age has the same frontal collision that somebody in their 30s who was a pro ball player had, you might split the old noggin in two. You know, um, the, the, the brain flops around and it can tear blood vessels on the surface. So you have a higher probability of subdural hematomas and, um, and epidural hematomas, which will kill you almost immediately. But a subdural hematoma it, it can take days and weeks for it to end up maturing out to the point where it's really quite symptomatic. So um, our, our cortex is something that's a, uh, um, a, a, very, uh, uh, a, a very sensitive uh, uh, organ. You don't want to be uh, bouncing it around. Earn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neurosciences NeuroGuide Workshop December 10th and 11th in Madeira Beach, Florida. It's led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend, online or in person with the link AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. And if you sign up now, you can join Dr. Robert Thatcher at his house for a pre-course get-together December 9th 
it's going to be a blast. What a better way to enjoy winter by being in Madeira Beach, Florida and earning up to 16 CEU hours. Sign up now at AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen NG hyphen workshops. This is also cortex. And you see the funny little stippled colored areas? These are called suppressor strips. If I stimulate number 19 here, it, it's associated with the visual cortex. And when I stimulate that, I actually get less visual cortex activity. Um, it, it, area 4S and, 4, uh, and area 4 are the premotor, the area that plays the motor strip, that the pianist, area 4S, and area 4, the actual motor strip. And these uh, again if you stimulate here you get an, an inhibition in these areas so these are suppressor strips and if you look and you say well what kind of brain is this where's where's the temporal lobe and where's the frontal lobe this is a mac monkey brain i mean not not every slide that i pull out here is a uh, is a human brain Th these slides were done uh, back in the uh, 40s and 50s um, as, as people try to learn neuroanatomy and neurofunction. Now, this is area 4S and area 4 without all the just surface. Now we're looking at the subcortical structures. Now, these are actually a whole bunch of cortical patterns that are seen in ADD. Now, about half the kids that had ADD had a theta pattern where there was an excess of theta. About a third of them had an excess of alpha. About 10% had a pure type of an excess of beta. And there was a, a almost 15% of them looked fairly normal at rest. When you put them on task, their, their brain shows pathology more. Uh, but this is, this is a, an N of about 400 kids uh, that uh, this was done by Gordon Serfontaine in Australia and uh, Bob Chabot from NYU uh, quite a few years ago, early 90s, uh, mid 90s. Um, so, uh, um, you know, not everybody who has the same behavioral presentation of ADD, ADHD has the same underlying pattern. When the frontal lobe is not working properly, you don't have proper control of your motor strips function. Uh, whether the frontal lobe is not working with theta or alpha or beta or a combination thereof, uh, you can end up having the same kind of behavioral presentation. You've disturbed the same underlying function uh, by disturbing the location. Um, here we have, uh, remember the, the motor strip went down to the caudate and then putamen globus pallidus. So, so here's the head of the caudate. When you have a motor tick, the discharge is, is from the head of the caudate. That's a simple tick. But the tail of the caudate merges with the stria terminalis and hooks into the amygdala and hippocampus. And uh, when you have Tourette's, you don't just have motor ticks that are just a, a simple motor tick. You also sometimes have limbic speech amygdala speech and you don't need to demonstrate that that we get ourselves pulled off the air here or something you know um uh, but uh, uh, swearing like a sailor when grandma wouldn't say that stuff uh if, if to save her soul you know so uh it, it, it the a Tourette speech is usually limbic speech terms of endearment and intense emotional terms so only rarely do you hear sweetie or honey coming out of a Tourette person. You might, but more often you're going to hear the swearing of the sailor. I don't know what it is about sailors, but apparently they swear a lot. So uh, the, the cerebellum, uh, the, 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 excuse me, the uh, amygdala hippocampus. The hippocampus is an emotional processor, and when the discharge hits here, you get echolalia or parroting. They repeat back in an echo of a memory. Um, you, you say something, uh, it gets echoed back at you. 
Now, I had a couple of sisters who played that one on each other, and that uh, that eventually that they'd really be uh, uh, absolutely you know upset that the other one was parroting things back and they couldn't make them stop and whatnot. But that's not Tourette's. That's just little sisters pestering. Uh, uh, Tourette is an involuntary movement. Uh, and it's an involuntary echoing back or involuntary speech. If it's the left hemisphere, it's more likely to be words. If the right hemisphere, it's more likely to be sounds, animal sounds, uh, grunting, moaning, um, uh, barking, uh, um, howling, you know, uh, animal sounds. Well, our cortex gets its information because of things coming up through the brainstem. And this graphic shows the ascending uh, uh, primary pathway of the, of the ascending reticular activating system. But it starts out actually with a, 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 a rising signal going up to your somatosensory strip. And that has collaterals into the multisynaptic ascending reticular activating system, which generally activates the brain. If you hear the sound of a twig snap, that shouldn't just activate your auditory cortex. It should get you up and rolling so that the snap of that twig, which meant that the bear is entering the cave, you're ready to actually respond. So you, you have individual sensory relays that can activate the brain more generally. And that's an adaptive feature. So um, you, you can have a sound or a smell or um, a, 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 a subtle tickle, you know, um, a, a spider walking along your arm on the hair on your arm. It's, it's, it's not, it doesn't hurt yet unless they bite. Um, uh, but you, you're, you, you, that little stimuli, if you're in the right circumstance, should really activate you. You don't want to be bit by a brown recluse and lose a big chunk of your leg uh, or wherever it happens to bite you. So um, uh, the, the, the brain activates the cortex with small inputs through the diffuse thalamic projection system, which projects to the brain generally. There's no sensory relay that sends something up to the front of your brain. That's not a sensory area, but the, 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 the diffuse thalamic projection system sends information to the front of the brain and everywhere else. It spares the primary sensory areas, which are busy processing sensory information, but it generally activates the rest of the cortex. Um, uh, uh, caudate, putamen, and globus pallidus, thalamus, uh, um, that they actually are all kind of close together. The line drawing uh, that we looked at here looked like we were jumping all over the place, but as you can see, they're actually spatially fairly contiguous. Um, we've, we've talked about the neurofeedback aspects of this um, uh, before and beta. Uh, what we were basically focusing on this time was some of the cortical findings. Um, we've talked a little bit about the cingulate. Um, the cingulate cor cortex gives you cognitive and emotional flexibility. Uh, the anterior aspect of the cing cingulate on the upper portion of its cognitive, on the rostral and subgenual portion of it, uh, it ends up being uh, uh, affective. And if it's not working, the cognitive and emotional flexibility that you normally can have is gone. You're either going to be locked on or off. It's, it's not functioning flexibly anymore. So you're either flipped to the on position or the off position. If it's on, you have an obsessive compulsive trait. Um, you're, you're stuck on. If you're off, you have a motivation, lack of initiation, uh, lack of motivation. So uh, if, you've seen people with the frontal lobe not working uh, and 
when it's not working, uh, they can end up having a, a variety of uh, presentations. Um, the cerebellum. Well, you know, we've been talking about all these basal ganglia, frontal lobe things with respect to movement being initiated in the cortex and going down to these little nuclear bodies and up to the motor strip, like that's all that motion have had to do. The cerebellum is tied directly into all those basal ganglia. And if it weren't for the cerebellum, when you reach for something, you reach past it, you'd knock it over. Um, it, 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 you're, um, you'd overshoot things. All the fine control would be gone. You'd have tremory, um, a bad movement control. So the cerebellum smooths and uh, coordinates uh, the movements, but it used to only be thought of as some kind of a movement smoother, you know? So it was, it was like a, a, a movement coach uh, sitting back there telling you not to, not to reach too far, not to reach too short, you know, just to reach just right, you know, it was just movement, but it's not. It, uh, the frontal lobe isn't just movement. It regulates attention and affect. And the more they've studied it, the more they realize that the cerebellum is also in intimately involved in affect and uh, attention. So, uh, um, you know, you can expect to see more and more work done in that area as they've discovered the applications. Now, the difficulty with the cerebellum is that it doesn't make, in traditional interpretations, externally visible EEG. And although there are those who are claiming to be able to see it, it's an extraordinary claim. Uh, it's an emerging um, application, and there's still some more proof to be done to show that that's actually what they're what they're seeing, and actually uh, accurately. Uh, uh, reflecting what they think they're seeing, um, and so the so the new soft so the companies that are saying they can pick up the cerebellum, it's uh, we're, I mean that's way back there. How do you pick up? Uh, how does that work? To it's got to go through a lot of head to pick yeah, up that cerebellum. And, and and every kind of tissue has a different level of conductivity and imp uh, impedance and resistance to flow. Uh, the, the, the cerebrospinal fluid and blood don't resist the same way as white matter or gray matter and bone and skin and meninges. Um, uh, there, there is a mathematical formula that says they make all of that transparent as as though it's a, 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 a totally glass brain you can see through um, electrically uh, measured directly through um, that's quite a claim I mean it's uh, it, uh, when when a claim comes by and it's asking it is asking you to think uh, in a way that other people have said is not possible um, it requires an extra few times thinking about it uh, before you can believe it necessarily. And at this point, uh, uh, the, the level of proofs are uh, um, arguable at best. Uh, uh, I, I spent a fair amount of time with Dr. Ritter, MD, PhD neurosurgeon. Uh, he looked at the evidence that was being uh, uh, purported as supportive evidence and said, well, there's lots of ways to end up with the outcomes that you're showing other than uh, you're seeing it uh, transparently. Uh, he did offer uh, the ability to do a test where uh, he, he puts in implants, uh, uh, um, uh, little electric implants to actually stimulate the brain to make it work better for people that have Parkinson tremor and other things. And uh, uh, because he uh, designs implants, um, well, he, companies design implants working with him. Uh, he's got implants in some people that actually measure the EG in the spot that they've been implanted. 
not just stimulating things, but actually measuring what's going on. Um, and he's offered, uh, since he's got electrodes in brains that measure things that are going on deep in the brain and spots that these people say they can see, he's offered to say, hey, um, why don't you hook up the surface and tell me what I'm seeing subcortically since I've got an electrode right there that can tell you exactly what I'm seeing. Those proofs were declined. So uh, until somebody's got enough um, a spinal process to actually accept a test like that, um, it looks to me like they don't have as much confidence in their product as they might need uh, to end up accepting that kind of a proof. So uh, it, it's still it, it's still buyer beware out in the world. And uh, when you have an extraordinary claim, you better look for extraordinary evidence. I'm um, I'm extraordinarily uh, conservative on what I'm going to accept as, uh, as something that's been declared not possible for uh, decades and decades and decades. Um, if they now say they can do it, uh, that they, they better have awfully good evidence. And so far, I've yet to see that. So the other things to add on the cerebellum, Jay, a couple things. Uh, in recent years, I don't know if it's recent years, just I've been recent. So <laughs> the uh, autism in the cerebellum, has that been popping up? And yeah, why, in fact, it has it, popped up so why, fa why, fairly why early it? on, in, in part because of some of their movement difficulties um, and affective regulatory difficulties. And again, in part, the understanding of the cerebellum's influence on affect and attention have come from studies in, in the autism spectrum. So uh, um, as we've learned uh, more about autism, we've learned more about the cerebellum as well. And then when a mom rocks their kid, the cere cerebellum is right there. How does that play a role in the kid's development? Well, rhythmic movement. Um, it, it, uh, uh, <laughs> some of us has got more rhythm than others. So, um, and, uh, right uh, you know, uh, who knows what kind of uh, rhythm or lack of rhythm uh, somebody may have been exposed to as a child. Uh, some people are put on a, on a movement ride at a fair and they'll puke all over because their, their body, they're, they're not used to being moved around and it, it scrambles their semicircular canals and they get dizzy and, 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 and hurl. Um, and others, you can put him in a 3D spinner and, and uh, you know, 3D spinner as all axes going. Uh, a, a good friend of mine, Don Bars, um, uh, used to fly uh, uh, nukes over in Europe uh, during the 70s. Um, and as a, as a, a pilot uh, um, put into a spinner, uh, they'll, they'll take a, a ball and it's, you know, a, a grass field uh, taller than the ball is and they've got you in a spinner and they say, okay, I'm going to toss this ball into the field. I want you to go find it when I let you out. They'll throw the ball somewhere and you're going zigzag, zigzag, zigzag all over the place. You don't know where the freak they threw that ball unless you have really, really good 3D you know, comprehension. And uh, Don, they'd open up that cage. He'd walk straight to the ball and pick it up. You know, so um, uh, and, and Don's a little. Well, Don's a good friend. He uh, he, he knows I call him crazy. Uh, Don Don's a little crazy. He's kind of like me. But if you're going to fly nukes and actually hit the button and drop one, you got to be crazy. So you know the. They don't just put pilots in those. Uh, they put pilots in there that actually would hit the button if they had to. So um, anyway, he's he's quieted down in his in his aging, and now he's he's a farmer, and um, uh, his you know the, the, uh, he 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 did quite a bit of very good neuroscience for quite a few years after he, after he was out of the military, but. Um, 
you 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 basically end up having the the cerebellum uh, and three D uh, 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 understanding of the world uh, all wrapped together with your semicircular canals. So, and not everybody does well with the three D spinner rides. Um, um, uh, it's not just a, a centrifuge to spin you with gravity being intense. This actually flips you upside down, backwards and forwards uh, with all of that happening at the same time. So it's a, uh, uh, unless you, uh, unless you've had a fair amount of uh, movement in your development, it, it, you're going to be overwhelmed with that fairly quickly, but you can learn it. And uh, with, especially with early life exposure to a lot of movement and acrobatic uh, movements as kids, um, you, you don't get car sick, seasick, uh, that, that kind of stuff is badly. I was going to say the figure skaters, they spin their head around really quick when they're spinning. Uh, how does that help them? <laughs> well, the, 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 they're trying to pick a point. So they're yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, to keep themselves from getting dizzy. Um, but that that's also practice. I mean, the, the same amount of spin on, on somebody who's not as good a dancer and they're going to be on the floor. Uh, that ever since they took my head apart to, to, to take the tumor out, my vestibular system has not really been as good as it should. And if, if I were to stand on a dance floor and make one spin, I would be flat on my face or my butt. I don't know which way I'd go down. So <laughs> a, at that point, up and down are impossible to differentiate. So, um, it, you know, the, but the, the cerebellum um, and uh, your ability to end up having uh, um, a, a, an intact relationship with the outside world are uh, I integral. You, know, you have to have that all working to end up operating. Um, and it's one of the reasons that blows to the back of the head um, in boxing are essentially that they don't want you to be hitting the brainstem or the cerebellum uh, because they can be rather permanently uh, debilitating. Anyway, that's most yeah. of the C's. I'm, I'm sure there's C's in there that we didn't mention, but um, uh, the, the, a lot of them we got to at least. Jay, I, I've seen enough of the C's. <laughs> Jay, thank you so much uh, for helping us with the neurofeedback alphabet uh, and the letter C. It's like Sesame Street. This is... This show's been brought to you by the letter C. <laughs> well, you know, um, uh, and, and I, I'm sure D and E and all the rest right, of them right, will be right, right, right. Uh, interesting to uh, to come up with as well. Jay, my friend, thank you so much. The Neuro Noodle Podcast is supported by listeners and viewers just like you. A special thanks to our gold and silver supporters. Earn up to 16 CEU hours by attending Applied Neuroscience's NeuroGuide Workshop December 10th and 11th in Madeira Beach, Florida. It's led by none other than Dr. Robert Thatcher himself. There are two ways you can attend online or in person with the link appliedneuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops and if you sign up now you can join dr robert thatcher at his house for a pre-course get together december 9th it's gonna be a blast what a better way to enjoy winter by being in madeira beach florida and earning up to 16 ceu hours Sign up now at AppliedNeuroscience.com slash attend hyphen ng hyphen workshops. MindMedia.com. Get the latest EEG and neurofeedback technology from MindMedia.com. Their semi-dry sensor cap is a wonder to see and their EEG amplifiers have been trusted in the field for decades. Their neurofeedback and QEEG courses will get you up to speed in no time Visit mindmedia.com now.